15 ugliest cars of the 1970s ever made. When asked about the ugliest cars of the 1970s, we're tempted to say all of them. The Nixon Ford Carter era, marked by big hair, wide ties, and gaudy vehicles, was not exactly a high point for design of any kind. Still, some cars stand out as particularly ugly, even by the standards of the decade. Brace yourself for a dozen and a half of the worst. 1970 AMC Gremlin. The Boston Bounce. The Chicago Shuffle. The Gremlin sold for two-thirds the cost of most small cars, which is appropriate because it looked like two-thirds of a car. Truth be told, the Gremlin was a stroke of corporate genius, cheap to develop and right for the times, and it was a runaway sales success, at least by AMC's modest standards. But did it have to be so ugly? It could have been worse. AMC considered a shortened version of the Hornet, that design chief Dick Teague said was even uglier. Though, considering that he signed off on the Gremlin, we're not sure his opinion can be trusted. Be cool. Attitude, remember? Where'd you get that? Out of the hamper? Hey, come on, this is clean. Look, friend, it's like riding a bike. You fall off, you get right back on. nineteen seventy buick riviera the second generation buick riviera was a breathtakingly beautiful car from nineteen sixty six until nineteen sixty nine with its racy lines and inboard hidden headlights however the subsequent design was a drastic departure featuring a grille that seemed to slide off the front and skirted rear fenders that looked like runaway mold growing over the wheels the whole body appeared bloated reminiscent of a drowning victim, causing Riviera sales, which had been steadily rising through the late 60s, to plummet when this redesign hit the showroom floor. Fortunately, it was replaced by the controversial yet beautiful boat tail Riviera in 1971. And the great new 1970 Thunderbird, with its daring new grille, executive control panel. 1970 Ford Thunderbird. The late 60 ST Birds, while not exactly pretty, were certainly non-offensive. Then 1970 came along, and Ford decided to stick a giant beak on the front. Seriously, Ford? What the hell? The emphasis should be on thunder, not bird. The Porsche 914 was sold from 1969 to 1976. It was a forgotten and somewhat unloved... 1970 Porsche, 914. Designing a well-proportioned mid-engine car is challenging, but Chevrolet has finally achieved it. The Porsche 914's strangeness goes beyond the vast space between the B-pillar and the rear wheel, including its awkwardly swept-back greenhouse, super-square bodywork, and relatively unadorned lines. These features make it a dorky-looking car that has embraced its dorkiness. So I'm gonna say right off the bat, it looked kind of pitiful buried beneath all the stuff out there, but out here in the daylight? While we love the 914, we believe a Porsche should look like a car you dream about, not the reality you wake up to.
The two-stroke was history, and Saab was about to launch its most successful model to date. Sweden and the rest of Western Europe. 1970 Saab Sonet 3. The third generation Sonet was designed with American buyers in mind, featuring a ridiculously elongated front overhang. This exaggerated schnozzle was further accentuated by a large 5 amp bumper. The awkwardly curtailed tail contrasted sharply with the long front, creating unbalanced proportions. Consequently, Americans didn't take Saab's seriously until the 900 came along. Nineteen seventy two Subaru GL Coupe. Subaru, like other Japanese automakers, was making steady inroads into the US market with smart, efficient, and practical small cars that were sensible, if not exactly stylish. So their designers tried stylish. And this is what happened. Ew. Our guess is that the Subaru GL was just a little too long to fit into the shipping crate. So the solution was to cut 8 inches off the tail, stick on a bumper and tail lights, and send it on its way. 76, Leyland P76, you are the very pits, and I dislike you. Leyland P76. 1973, Leyland P76. Lest you think that British Leyland only made Brits miserable, the P76 is proof that the world's most notorious crap car conglomerate tried to spread that despair to the farthest corners of the Commonwealth. The P-76 was a big, wedge-shaped car produced by Leyland Australia, designed to fit a 44-gallon drum in the trunk, preferably full of something incendiary. Besides being ugly, the P-76 was built with all the care and quality for which Leyland was known. In other words, none. And after two years and just 18,000 sales, the P-76 was history. Braithwell. You can see the sun exploding on a kaleidoscope of colour. And I have to say, there's been a real area of controversy here because over the last few days, my God! 1973, Reliant Robin. The Reliant Robin, emblematic of three wheel cars, often embodies the epitome of automotive despair. Its austere design, with goggle eyed headlights, fails to conceal its subcar status evoking a desperate plea for affection. Rescuing waitresses from cocktail. Oh! Help! 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 Again, help! Unlike its predecessor, the Reliant Regal, which mustered a modicum of dignity, the Robin stands as a stark reminder of automotive limitations. Its appearance, synonymous with financial constraint, elicits a justified reluctance to extend any semblance of admiration. Enormously, but the consequences were catastrophic. 1974, Bricklin SV1. Malcolm Bricklin, infamous for his Subaru 360 and Yugo Ventures, showcased his own design, the Safety Vehicle 1, embodying a blend of style and disaster. Sporting oversized bumpers, narrow windows, and dated turbine vane wheels, it screamed 70s kitsch. Assembled with dismal quality, panels warped pre-assembly, headlights stayed hidden, and leaks were rampant. The 90LB gullwing doors often malfunctioned, trapping owners inside due to buggy electronics. The Bricklin SV1 epitomized both visual and practical unattractiveness.
introduces Mustang II, the right car at the right time. Because it's small, even smaller than the original Mustang, but built with jewel-like quality, unexpected luxury. 1974 Ford Mustang II, the downsized Mustang II, whether a stroke of genius or a national tragedy, remains debatable. However, the major visual offense was the luxury-themed Ghia model, adorned with opera windows in a misguided attempt at sophistication. The addition of a padded vinyl formal roof and color-teed bumpers felt like a crime against humanity, while the borrowed hubcaps from the Granada hardly went unnoticed. Despite its strong sales, the Mustang II's success seemed to defy its Ghia variant rather than embrace it. Nineteen seventy-four, Vanden Plas, fifteen hundred. The Detroit Three, criticized for badge engineering, in the seventies and eighties, witnessed British Leyland mastering this dubious craft with the Vanden Plas, fifteen hundred. Born from the Austin Allegro's misery, it boasted a stand-up chrome grill, genuine leather seats, deep pile carpet, and fold-down walnut tables for backseat lunches all at nearly double the Allegro's price, perhaps targeted at those who desired a Jaguar XJ6, but settled for smaller and crappier alternatives. For a pleasant surprise, because now you can get that room and ride in the first wide small car, the AMC Pacer. Now that may explain why more than half the people buying the Pacer are trading in bigger cars for it. Uh, they've discovered they didn't need most of their big car anyway. 1975 AMC Pacer. The Pacer, AMC's brainchild, hailed as the pioneer of wide, small cars, boasted cute commercials, but sported an unappealing exterior. Its vast glass area intended for enhanced visibility left drivers feeling like simmering goldfish in a bowl. The rear end with taillights resembling cake-frosting spatula designs only added to its aesthetic woes. AMC's 1978 rendition, featuring a bulging hood and stand-up grille to accommodate the optional V8, aimed to boost power for the weighty glass ensemble. However, with gas-guzzling six-cylinder engines, the Pacer prioritized brawn over economy, ultimately earning its status as a car for dorks in an era yet to embrace their coolness. 1977, Datsun 200SX. In the late 1970s, Datsun, later Nissan, gained a solid reputation in the U.S. with models like the B210, 510, and the iconic 240Z. Then came the 200SX, a rear-drive sports coupe with a 2-liter engine and a grille resembling an electric shaver. Despite limited rearward visibility due to the C-pillar, complaints were scarce, likely due to its low popularity. However, the 200SX fell short on both performance and fuel efficiency, excelling instead in rusting at an alarming rate, leaving few survivors today. 1977, Leata Caballero. Mr. Donald E. Steinbach from Port Falls, Idaho, took the abysmal Chevrolet Chevette and transformed it into a spectacle, adding 350 pounds of Bondo and fiberglass to mimic the styling of the first-generation Monte Carlo. His creations, including a few El Camino-inspired pickup trucks, sold for nearly double the Chevette's price, despite 
their absurd appearance. Dubbed after his wife, albeit with a misspelled Spanish word for gentleman, these Franken cars garnered attention, though Mr. Steenabock ultimately faced financial loss, bringing some semblance of justice to his peculiar endeavor. 1978 Oldsmobile Cutlass, Aeroback. General Motors downsized its midsize cars, opting for a European-inspired look with hatchback-like features. Unfortunately, the results were dismal, with consumers avoiding the Buick Century and Oldsmobile Cutlass Aeroback models. Despite not being true hatchbacks, sales suffered, leading to GM's regretful decision to forego traditional sedan options. Only after plummeting sales did GM introduce a proper sedan in 1980, leaving many questioning the company's design choices throughout the 1980s. In 